Episode 54, the founder and chairman of the Charles Schwab Corporation, Charles Schwab. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Charles Schwab. Charles is the founder and chairman of the Charles Schwab Corporation. What began as a small discount brokerage company in the 70s, has evolved to become the nation's largest publicly traded investment services firm with close to four trillion in client assets. He is also the chairman of the Charles and Helen Schwab Foundation, a private foundation focused on education, poverty prevention, human services, and health. He is the author of several best selling books, with the latest memoir titled Invested. Chuck, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be with you, Glenn. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Chuck, you grew up in the wake of the Great Depression. And you know, you mentioned how your parents' attitudes toward money shaped some of your thinking. So I'd love just to hear more about that. Well, in the early days, I was you know, being of the age when I was born in the late 30s. And uh, as a consequence, I, my early childhood was through the end of the Depression years of the 30s and, in, and then moving into World War II. And there was a period there of great limitation also in the war cause, all the rationing and all that kind of thing. So money was a very difficult thing to have. People didn't have a lot of money at the time. And we lived in a small farming town near Sacramento, California. And my father was a lawyer ended up being the district attorney of the of the county there. So he was a very successful guy in that those terms, but still the, he was paid by the county. And uh, so there wasn't uh, a whole lot of money to splash around. So things, for instance, if I got a new bike, it wasn't a new bike, it was a used bike. And that was very, but I was really proud about it. But I knew about the limitations of money and we talked about it all the time in the household. Uh, yeah, that's nice to have, but we can't afford it now, that kind of conversation. So I grew up in that atmosphere and uh, has, I think, a lot of influence on my early thinking about where I wanted to go in life, and that was to really improve my status as in financial sense. And so I obviously went on to focus on finance. So, I mean, that being the case, would you say that financial independence was one of the big motivators of the whole entrepreneurial journey you went I on? have to admit at that age, I was probably not that sophisticated to think about that in those big terms of financial independence. But yeah, I definitely wanted to have my own money. And I think that's clearly what that meant. So I want to talk about school a little bit. You had dyslexia. I don't know that it was necessarily diagnosed as such at the time, but certainly you would learn later that that's what you had. So I'm guessing it meant that it took you a lot longer to figure things out. Maybe it was more of a struggle going through school, going through classes. What kind of effect back then during that period, just growing up in your youth, did that have on you? Well, because dyslexia was really not a scientific word used at the time, they didn't really know much about it, but it turns out I found out more about it when I actually was in my late 30s, early 40s, when my son was diagnosed having the same thing. So all those years, it was a great aha moment for me when I was 40, but uh, through those years, I didn't really know, didn't think about it that much. I just had my own personal handicap, which means I read very, very slowly. So I had to figure out techniques to accommodate that. Uh, reading a book. I might spend a lot of time on the table of contents. I might read, you know, conclusions of different chapters and get the picture of the whole book. Uh, and I could do that, but I didn't read the whole book for sure. Cause I didn't have the time to read a whole book because my form of dyslexia was a very slow reading pattern. So I just dealt with it and uh, figured out different kinds of things to uh, sort of accommodate my 
ability to learn as I could learn for sure. And I could memorize and I could think and I could conceptualize, but I just had word, uh, word reading difficulty. And, and I guess maybe my vocabulary, even at the time might've been less formed because of the problem. So look, I, I honestly don't know much about it. I've, I've certainly known people that have dyslexia, but I, I would think that when one has some kind of, if you want to uh, call it a learning disability, they're one of two paths people may take. One is to say, okay, I'm just going to have to work that much harder uh, to make up for the fact that I'm slower and things don't come as readily for me. Right. The, the other path, frankly, the path of least resistance is to sort of wave the white flag and say, you know what, the, the heck with it. I'm just not going to be a good reader. I'm just not going to be good in certain things in life. And they probably get very deflated, uh, maybe depressed, and they they sort of give up. Well, there's a lot. I've spent a lot of time on it uh, since I achieved some success in life. And I've put together a, a variety of ways to help and give back in the world of those people who do suffer from dyslexia. It actually happens to be today's science around one in seven kids have some issue around learning differences. I wouldn't say it's quite popular, but it happens to a lot of children. It's, it's an issue that deals with your brain and, and deals with your ability to phonological processing that goes in your head. And so you're born with it as such. Another implication uh, of dyslexia has been when I found out that nearly 50% of the population of prisons were with people who have dyslexia. So there are a lot of those people, obviously, they were smart thinking people, but they didn't do well in school. They did design for themselves different kinds of paths, usually a criminal path. You probably know some people that are, seem incredibly capable, but deep down, they probably didn't do particularly well in school. And they may have had a real problem in reading and possibly in writing. Usually they go together. Mm -hmm. And so uh, today, though, it's rather interesting that uh, you're doing different kinds of forms of interviews that wouldn't be on uh, pods and so forth. Uh, so there's all kinds of ways to read books and get information by simply listening to, to books on tape, for instance, uh, which was not available when I was a kid. So there are all kinds of ways to accommodate and take care of these kids that have issues, uh, for sure, and with technology today. So it's not a terrible thing to have as long as your parents are continue to uh, foster your confidence and make sure that you're they know you're a smart kid and you just have a little problem around reading you see some history of many uh, dyslexics some are very famous uh, and very successful entrepreneurs usually they're entrepreneurs some successful doctors some very successful lawyers who have been identified themselves having dyslexia. So it's not the end of the world for sure, but it sure is important though the parent identify it and then help the kid along the way and make sure he never loses his self-confidence. That's the death knell. That's the way go on a very negative path. Yeah. So I want to fast forward uh, to the Charles Schwab Corporation, of course. Um, but before we get there, that wasn't your first entrepreneurial endeavor. You had failed a couple times before. So I'm curious, what were those prior ventures and what lessons were you able to carry forward from those startups that maybe helped improve the odds of success? You know, all the way through my youth, I was always working in some capacity, whether it was early on mowing lawns or raising chickens. And obviously, my quest was to earn money and become somewhat independent. You know, a 15 year old becoming independent is a little bit optimistic, but uh, at least I was trying. So all the way through, and then years later, when I became 16, 17, 18, I could get bigger and better jobs. And usually in the summertime, I spent obviously the school year in school. And, uh, but I did jobs like driving tractors on a farm, uh, I was worked in the oil fields one summer as a roustabout. I worked in the railroad in Chicago one summer for two different railroads, actually. And I was a switchman. I did uh, other things uh, that sort of 
compliment myself. I try to be a salesman one summer selling. Uh, I did two, two things. I was actually a real failure at it. One was selling life insurance. When I found out how bad the product was, I said, I can't sell this to anybody. So I had to quit and then end up that summer. The only job I could find was selling insulation for, for new houses. So I went door to door on that. But these all helped develop my ability to talk with people, listen to people, uh, be friendly with people, be interested in their stories as well. Uh, I think that did a lot of good development of me by being active and seeking out these different very primitive employment activities. So when you started the Charles Schwab Corporation, why the name the Charles Schwab Corporation? So in 73, uh, I had a little company It was called at the time First Commanders, and I ended up owning all the stock. It was not a very successful company, let me tell you. And so the people that I had four of their shareholders in the thing, I bought all their stock back by taking over their loans. And so I was 100% shareholder at the time, so I wanted to change the name of the company. So I went to the Secretary of the State with th four or five different names, and they said, well, that's too close to... Schwab Drugstore in Los Angeles, which is very famous at the time. I was going to call it Schwab Investments. I went through about three or four iterations. Finally, I said, well, how about my own name? And they said, that's okay. So my name was Charles Schwab. That was I was born with. And so that's how it all started. I mean, did you think in some way having your name tied to the company would enable success in some way? I had no idea where this was going to end up. No. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was probably 33, 34, something like that at the time, full of a lot of ambition and so forth. Uh, had just the notion of the discount brokerage thing. Got a sense that there was a real need for it because the few customers that did come in, they said, why didn't you start this 10 years ago? Well, I said I couldn't because the laws weren't, would not permit it. So I had a lot of affirmation from different customers that sort of heard about us what we were beginning to do, we were discounting transactions in really in 70, late 73 and 74. And then, of course, it became across the board uh, permissible on any transaction. I mean, everything seems obvious in hindsight. You know, a discount brokerage, of course, why not? Because the essence of it was let's strip away all the advice and all these other components and just go for bare bones you know, easy, quick, affordable transactions for self-directed investors. But Glenn, there was another part to it, it probably that I didn't speak about, which I wanted to do it completely differently than traditional Wall Street. I always believed today, as I did 40 some years ago, that there was always a conflict of interest relationship between the broker and me, the buyer of the stock, that they call it a commission. So you don't pay a commission to your lawyer. You don't pay a commission to your doctor. It basically it, some kind of a fee, but they really thought about a commission because hotshot brokers made 50% of the commission. So they were getting paid a high sales incentive reward for moving stocks and selling stocks. And at the time, commissions were extraordinarily high. You were paying something like 1% to 2% of the transaction every time you made a buy and a sell. Well, of course, today they're now free, but back then, and you can imagine the more you turned somebody's portfolio over, the more money you could make. So commission brokers were just that. They were my croupiers in a, you know, in a, in a crap table in Las Vegas. Roll those dice, put transactions up, and you know, over time you're gonna make a heck of a lot of money as a broker. Now, I don't know what about the customer. That wasn't their worry so much. All they had to do was come up with a great story. So anyway, I decided to do something completely different. And as a result, all our people who took orders at Schwab, then, as today, are paid a salary. And then get a bonus based upon the success of the company. Completely different. Took the commission out of the whole relationship. You saw this conflict of interest, which, of course, in hindsight, so obvious, you know, but not so much at the time because that's the way the business was done. That's the way it was. It had always been done. Yeah. So, so when you come up with 
these and and you know innovation has been a theme of course you know throughout your career are you just going off of well this is how i feel and my gosh surely if i feel this way there must be millions of others that feel this way is it just an instinctual thing or do you try to have some kind of hypothesis that you back up with a lot of market research and data and that sort of thing well i couldn't afford any of that stuff back then i simply in a very small way, we had very small advertising in San Francisco. Uh, we were using the West Coast edition of the Wall Street Journal. Our ad was simply one column by three inches. That's all I could afford. But there were people who could read that, would come into the office, check me out. I'd do the transaction for them at a huge discount. And there would be nobody pushing them. They'd, they'd go do their research. They'd read Value Line or some kind of a research report, Forbes magazine, and get an idea. And I didn't convince them one way or the other. They had the freedom to do exactly what they want to do without any interruption from a broker. It was a completely different path. And it turned out there were quite a few people that were independent type people and who could make up their own ideas. And so I thought that group might have been 5% of the investors, 10% maybe. Uh, Stanford Research Institute did a study in 19, mid 70s. They thought about 15% of the investing population would probably find some value in discount brokerage. That encouraged me a lot. That 15% is a lot of people. I was just a teeny little company, of course, at the time. So I was very optimistic about our future. What's interesting is, is a big part of your early on customer acquisition strategy was to you know have these local branches that you open up you know, people walk in now now i understand early on before the days of the internet before the days of call centers you know you had to have a physical point of presence but but even after all that technology was in place you continue to have these branches which you know ended up being a, a huge part of how you're able to build the business talk about that piece of things why was that physical presence so important well glenn uh as you understand, we had no salesman. Unlike a traditional brokerage firm, we didn't have somebody calling at six o'clock in the evening, hour after hour, cold calls. We had nobody doing that. So the only way we got people who were interested in us, they'd see an ad. So that was our early beginnings. Then I opened up an office in Sacramento, California. My first office was in San Francisco and we were doing fine. And we opened up the office in Sacramento. All of a sudden, our sort of share of market numbers that I was looking at went up substantially for that little community of Sacramento. It was quite small then, relatively. It's pretty big now. And it gave me a lot of confidence that maybe the combination of a branch where we had a physical branch where people could actually walk in and see the whites of our eyes and say, we're okay, people. We're not criminals. We're there because we're handling their money. They're doing substantial transactions, you know, thousands of dollars. And so I think that identified to them that they're real people and it gave them the confidence that they could do business with us. So I think the branches were a way to really add to our credibility as opposed to simply just a office in Omaha, Nebraska and doing it by an 800 number because we're dealing with people's money, their savings, things that are really important to them. Well, you continue to open up more and more branches. Yeah, well, we now have 375 offices and uh, open 24-7, you know, in terms of our online capabilities. So success continued and expanded and the business was doing well. And then if you fast forward uh, some years, you decided to sell the company to Bank of America. And of course, it gave the company much needed credibility access to capital, obviously, uh, you know, enormous financial security for yourself, Chuck. But in hindsight, it probably wasn't the smartest deal in the world. And you ended up buying the business back from, from Bank of America. So what happened there? Glenn, you might figure out the fact that that was in 1980, 81. And at the time, investment bankers would not finance it. I, we were growing quickly and I couldn't raise money fast enough to build the capital base I needed to support the growth. You know, money for new offices, money for training, money for 
clearing all, all the things why you would need capital. Uh, Wall Street obviously thought of us as, as deathly competitors, so had no interest in financing us at the time. So I turned to, the, to a couple banks, and uh, B of A liked our business model so much, they decided rather than lend us the money, they put an offer on the table to buy us. And the number was, at the time, $20 million. That It was a $50 million transaction, but my piece was $20 million. Can you imagine somebody had no money ever, and they flashed $20 million in front of you in 1981? Yeah, it'd be really something very appealing. And I thought it'd be cool and all that stuff. And It'd, it'd be appealing in, in uh, 2022. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so all those things happened. So it was a learning process for me. I sold the company, worked like a dog to keep that subsidiary growing. And it was one of the fastest growing subsidiaries of the Bank of America. But what happened to the bank, it fell on bad times, the parent bank. And so it began selling its assets in order to bolster their capital. So I said, well, why don't you sell us back to me? There were lots of reasons why I was having, I was really unhappy about their stock's performance, as well as there were restrictions on what we could do as a bank subsidiary. I couldn't move into money market funds. I had difficulty moving into mutual funds. I wanted to do all the things that we did do eventually on mutual fund marketplace, all those things I couldn't do unless we got approval from the Federal Reserve. The bank was in bad shape and couldn't, everything it did had to be approved by the Federal Reserve. I mean, they basically stripped away your ability to innovate. Yeah, to grow. And so it was, became very clear to me I had to get out of there. So you know, shortly after you bought the company back, you took the company public. And the IPO happened September 1987. It was less than a month away from Black Monday. And so you know, the good news, Chuck, is you got out in the nick of time. Uh, the bad news is you're now going to be exposed to the public during a horrendous time with the market crash. So it was a pretty bumpy ride. Can you talk about that period? Well, it was a certainly a very bumpy ride. Uh, we had had just gone public and because we were had to keep our registration, every, every time we moved, we had to report to the public the bad things, no matter how bad they were, we had to report within a timely manner. And so, most companies could wait until quarter in. We had to report almost on a daily basis how well we were doing because we were in the registration period. As a consequence, through the crash, we ended up with one particular customer had sold some naked puts and was really, the naked puts go up in value when the market drops. And that Chicago exchange at the time sort of was basically shut down. They were locked markets. They were cross markets and so forth. And so we had a tough time valuing, evaluating what he had and to get us a margin call and so forth. So he was a very large investor, very wealthy person, but he lived in Hong Kong and he had accounts all over Wall Street. And we were obviously one place, but we were somewhat vulnerable having just gone public. We got through it okay in a fine, fine way. We lost a bunch of money, but it was enough to to learn a lot of lessons out of it about our risk control. And so that would never happen again. Anyway, it was a agonizing time period for us and the company. Uh, you know, by 1990, 89, 90, we were clearly back sailing on the upside again. So, yeah, I want to talk about that period sailing on the upside because there was a, a point following the crash where, yes, you'd survive to live another day, but you were essentially stuck. Uh, customers, assets, you know, all, all the important metrics weren't growing. And, you know, while you would come to dominate the discount brokerage industry, there just wasn't enough of that niche to, to keep growing. So you came up with this new service to tap into a growing market. Uh, you called it one source. And that along with a couple other businesses, would help propel the company throughout that next decade. Uh, you would grow from 2,600 to 26,000 employees. It was an incredible period of hyper growth. So one, I guess the first part is just curious about what was that business that really changed the business you were in, essentially. 
And what was that like going through that kind of growth? It can't all be uh, fun and games, right? Well, fortunately, I was young enough, had a lot of energy, and had a lot of a number of committed people that worked around me. I was pretty good at creating a management teams to do that with. And, you know, internet didn't come into play until really 1996, 97. So there was that time period between 89 and that time period that we were doing all kinds of things to, uh, you know, between offices. We had an online thing, which we use AOL, AOL and uh, CompuServe was sort of a very clunky online kind of thing. We had that capability. There were lots of things, innovation, mutual fund marketplace came out, which was an incredible innovation for people who love to buy no load mutual funds, taking the fees out. That was a very popular service that we offered. Obviously, even earlier than that, we went to 24 seven in terms of service. People love that. You know, it used to be brokers were like banks. They'd be open from nine in the morning or 10 in the morning to three kind of thing. It's five days a week. We went to very quickly and everyone followed us, of course, but people wanted to be, look at their account and do their work maybe Sunday afternoon, not necessarily Wednesday afternoon, but Sunday afternoon. And so, or later in the day, we, of course, dealing across the country of, you know, a number of time zones. And so people had different needs at different times of the day. So that was very popular. So we kept doing, pushing the envelope on every kind of thing we could really enhance the customer experience. So you get through the 90s, the business grows many, many times over, and then we hit the now famous tech meltdown of uh, you know, of 2000, and it, it hit your business pretty hard. You had to let thousands of people go. As importantly, you felt that in essence, the company had lost touch with its customers, had lost its sense of purpose, and and had some serious morale issues, of course, with all the layoffs on top of that. So, you know, in essence, it had lost its way. Can you talk about that period and how you were able to to get through it? Because that's on the heels of this incredible growth that you had. Yeah, well, it was a, a, a time period, adoption of internet, in the late 90s, and then the crash of the early 2000s, the crash of all the dot-com companies was occurring. And consequently, our client base, who had owned a lot of those stocks, their portfolios were shrinking. And as a result, their transactions went down, their clients either lost money or just got discouraged about investing and left. And so we had gotten up to a very high point in terms of employment to take care of the customers along the way. And so we had to virtually let over a couple of years, about 50% of our client of our employees go. And that was a very painful period for any entrepreneur. And then uh, we did some other things to sort of help the company along the way. I had stepped away at being CEO for a couple of years there. I was sort of co-CEO and then another fellow became CEO. I stepped back in in 04 that we had to sort of restructure the company and make it move from a simple transaction company to a relationship company. That was done in 04. And it was, of course, a very seminal moment for us. And, of course, it's worked extremely well to this moment. Yeah, you know, there was a period of time when Starbucks had hit a lull. Howard Schultz had already moved out and, you know, stepped back into that CEO role to turn the company back on its, on its right path. So, and, and I know the two of you aren't the only ones. I, what I'm curious about, Chuck, is I think often in these periods, um, these challenging periods, these identity crises, if you will, morale issues and all sorts of market challenges and business challenges. It's interesting that often it's the founder stepping back into that role. And I'm just wondering, is it the kind of situation where probably only the founder would be able to correct things? I think that usually is the founder that has to do that because he has or she has the confidence of the employees. And yes, it's a raw change and people have to either believe you or not. And 
there's only one person that really has that kind of position, I think, in the, in the business. That's the person who founded the company, who can make that really fundamental change. It's usually the founder that probably has to make that big, big leap. But I, I would assume that the challenge, though, is, I mean, it's your baby. It's your baby. So you're sticking in it and you have to take all the, the grief that's there and, and, of course, take some of the rewards when it, if it does come. Or you find an alternative path. So they say, we we're going to make a strategic change here. That usually means you're going to sell the company. And I was not interested in doing that. I knew we had a fundamental capability that the public really needed and wanted and supported. And we had to just get through that boom of the internet period, which was crazy in many respects. And we were crazy in our valuation at the time. As you can look back at so many companies at that moment in time, we're signed at 40, 50, 60 times earnings. It was absurd. And I knew that, but nothing I could do about it. Just we had to live through it. It wasn't real. I want to talk a bit about innovation. Most CEOs talk a big game when it comes to innovation, but the reality is few embrace it. And it's like it's always been a part of your DNA, Chuck. Even as you got big and established, there was always this real strong you know, innovation streak in you. And you mentioned that being willing to innovate means that you've got to compete with your own business. You, you have to be willing to disrupt yourself. Much easier said than done, I would assume. Well, you have to have faith that you're going to come out at the other end better off than you were going into it. Any number of times we did that, and success usually came if it was a great idea. And uh, it happened certainly with the internet. When we introduced the internet capability, we dropped prices like 50%. We were always going down anyhow, but it was a very wonderful thing to do. And, and of course, everyone adopted. Everyone loved what we were doing. And we had thousands of new customers coming in, millions, as a matter of fact. When we introduced mutual fund marketplace, it was something that never been done before. Buying no-load mutual funds through a one-account kind of thing, we helped hundreds of small investment mutual funds. We didn't help Fidelity much. In fact, we <laughs> hurt Fidelity. But we helped zillions of small investment mutual fund companies just with our distribution. We opened it up to the nation. We were well rewarded for that. It's been a whole lot of fun doing those innovative things. And I think it's all part of the reason you got to be, if you're not innovative, you're going to die anyhow, because someone else is going to probably come up with the idea too. So I, I want to go back for a minute to the dyslexia. And, you know, you had mentioned that, you know, you're certainly not the only entrepreneur with dyslexia. Henry Ford, Richard Branson, uh, the IKEA founder, you know, just a few amongst a sea of really uh, ultra successful people with it. So I was curious if dyslexia provided any kind of unique capability that enabled some of what you need to build a business that, I don't know, maybe heightened certain parts of the brain in, in some way. My view is that it generally are more conceptual. We don't get lost in the weeds of detail. It's as easy as I can explain it. Uh, some people I know are extremely literal in learning. They got to go step one, step two, step three. A dyslexia goes from one to 10 very quickly. May not even go through two to eight because they deal with the concepts and they come up with the ideas and some of them are pretty crappy ideas. And uh, so you have to, when you're dealing with a dyslexic, make sure you only figure out the best ideas. <laughs> how does that tie in, the, the going from step one to 10, how does that tie into that innovation part of things? Well, you, you visualize what it might look like. You know, you visualize how wonderful the world would be at the time with no load mutual funds being available across the board and a touch of a button. Back when I first interested in no load mutual funds, which I'm sure you are too, they were the best place for people to go, the lowest cost and usually the best performing. But people didn't know about them. There was very weak distribution. You couldn't afford to sell. But we, being a sizable company at the time, we could afford to let the world, let the country know, our client base know that these were available and what their track records were. 
So all of a sudden, our distribution capability created a massive market for these wonderful, fast-growing, no-load mutual funds. But we had to do a lot of things to bring them all together. There was a lot that had to go in behind the scenes to make that all happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, so obviously, you know, envisioning this future, uh, this future state is really important. If you think about what is it about Charles Schwab, <laughs> you, Chuck Schwab, yeah. right? What is it about you that enabled success for such a long period of time? Well, I have a deep passion about an investor and how important investors investing is to America and the success of America. It goes to all the innovation we talk, all the creativity, all that happens because there are people behind the scenes making investments in ideas. There aren't all start with ideas and the creative kinds of things. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in technological changes, whether it's in communication, whether it's in entertainment, whatever it might be, there are creative people behind and money behind that to make it happen. So money and capital, and that's why this country is, this point is really invincible because we have such a robust capitalist system where money is moving as quickly as possible into great ideas. Not all of them work out. That's okay. That's why they call it risk capital. You take risk. And sometimes there's a big reward. Sometimes there's a big failure. I've had many failures in my history too. But look, I could take, you know, a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand people who were passionate about investing and let them all try to start a company around that with your exact concept. And the reality is 99.9% .9 of them are going to fail. So yeah, you got to have the vision. You got to be passionate about it. But going from being passionate to having a multi-decade crazy uh, success story is, is a completely different story. Well, thank you. You don't do it alone. And you have to know how to have people join you in the, in the crusade. Our crusade is about helping people in the investing thing, introduce the general public to investing in the six and what you can achieve from that, how you can really change the outcome of your financial life by successful investing, low cost investing, diversification, all the things that we try to promote and how to do it methodically and on, over time and growth and you know more growth, adding more to it, all the things, whether it's through your 401k or IRA, all those things are really ways to get the average American to move forward. I'm not talking just about making billionaires. I'm talking about millions and millions of Americans, get them into the game. And if they're into the game, boy, they're going to have success over 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years. That's what it's about. And when you're building these teams, I'm sure you've made some incredible hires, obviously. They're all as passionate about what we do as I am. So the passion is really important. What, what else, besides obviously the domain and the technical expertise they may, must have and whatever it is, what, what else do you look for? What, what's the other sort of X factor, if you will? It has to be their, their character, their ethics, their responsibility to the customer. It's really important to me that they treat the customer in a fiduciary sense all the time. They're precious to us. I don't care if you're tiny customer or large customer, you're still precious to us. We want to make sure you, we help you foster your growth in your, in your wealth, starting from a small point to a higher point. So when you build a company like this, it is a hundred percent commitment, right? This isn't a nine to five kind of endeavor. This is nights, this is weekends. And I'm wondering if in hindsight, there are any regrets in terms of things that maybe got sacrificed along the way outside of the pursuit of this success? Well, there's having children early on in my career was great. Uh, but I have to say, I didn't spend a lot of time at the soccer field as a parent. So those were periods of my own deficiency, but I devoted to the work thing. So I try to make it up to them today. So those are things I wish I had accomplished, but didn't have the time to do that. So that suffered. You know, since I don't read a lot of novels, since I don't read any novels, frankly, I'm reading only business stuff. And 
usually when I have free time, I'm thinking about something, the next big thing. Chuck, I know golf has been a lifelong passion of yours. Any sort of parallels between golf and the business world? Oh, there's tons of parallels. There's rules of the game, which are very, very well formulated. Lots of hard work. More practice means you do better. I think practice is very important in, in a successful business person. Practice meaning putting time into it. There are a lot of parallels. I, but I just as a matter of fact, I, I think one of the things I got from sports as a kid was confidence. I was pretty good at sports, whatever sport I had. I just wasn't big enough to be the basketball player I wanted to be. I played B basketball, but so then I moved to golf and tennis to such. But I was, that gave me a lot of confidence. I was an okay guy. My grades were okay, but I went to public schools and hacked my way along. And I was never, <laughs> I was never going to be the, the Phi Beta Kappa. Well, you're, you're well educated. So a little more than hacking for sure. Check the name of this podcast is The Art of Excellence. So when you think of the word excellence, what's the word mean to you? Well, my view, it's a very active word, and it doesn't stop just in one moment. It's always trying to perfect it. It's somewhat like we talk about golf. Golfers are never happy with their round. They always know they can do a little bit better. And that's the way I feel about Schwab. We can always do a little bit better. We're always trying to strive towards excellence. We never achieve it, maybe for a fleeting moment, but it's the next day we got to worry about. Hmm. Well, I, I got to tell you, in the day and age of these overnight unicorn success stories that come and go, to have someone like yourself that has built a thriving business that has been around for so long and, and continues to thrive and seems, you know, I, I didn't know you, <laughs> you know, back when you started it, but I mean, I can just see and, and hear the passion coming from you, you know, decades and decades later. It, it is uh, such an honor to spend this time with, uh, with you, Chuck. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you, Glenn. My pleasure. Hey, thanks for listening. Okay, don't go. Don't go yet, please. Two favors, I ask. Simply two favors. One, if you could please download the iTunes app. You could do it on your phone. You can do it on the computer. Um, take 60 seconds and leave a review. It means a lot. Two, you can find my episodes on several social media sites, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Find the one that you like the most. Find the one where you tend to have a lot of friends and followers. And if you could please either share it in the case of uh, Facebook and LinkedIn or retweet it uh, on Twitter, uh, that would mean the world to me. So those are the two asks I have. I love putting together this podcast. I hope you enjoy listening to it. Thank you so much. And I will see you again next time. Bye-bye.